Welcome to a special web edition of CNBC's election coverage. I'm Steve Leisman, senior economics reporter. Imagine it's Wednesday or whenever we learn the results of the election. What data will we look back on from the polls and say that was the thing that was decided? To answer this question, I've got a group of experts when it comes to the polling data, probably one of the geekiest groups we've ever brought together. We have Mark Murray, NBC News senior political editor and really the dean of all polling here at NBC. Steve Kornacki, NBC News national political correspondent, a guy who has uh, made a, a, a real specialty of doing calisthenics in front of a plasma. Micah Roberts, uh, he's the partner at Public Opinion Strategies, which is the, who's the public pollster for NBC and CNBC. And of course, Jay Campbell is the partner at Heart Research, our Democrat pollster. Mark, I want to start with you. You did the courageous thing of doing a poll Sunday morning and you polled all the way through Saturday night, which I would never ever do. And you came up with a 49-49 split. But inside that, it hides deep divisions in this country. Talk about some of the divisions out there in terms of, for example, the gender gap and income gaps and educational gaps that are there. Yeah, Steve, our, our poll ends up showing a 34 point gender gap with Donald Trump winning men by 18 percentage points and Kamala Harris winning women by 16 points. And that's actually larger than the 30 point gender gap that we ended up showing in on our October survey. And as you mentioned, there are big divides when it comes to uh, the uh, education status in our poll. Just Democrats are in one corner, Republicans are in another. And I think that that's kind of reflected in that 49, 49 overall tie. But Steve, you mentioned kind of some of the things we're looking for possibly. And one thing I'm fixated in our poll are the change questions. Who better represents change? Kamala Harris having a five point advantage in our poll on that question. But then when asked another way, what concerns you more? Would Harris follow in Joe Biden's footsteps or would Donald Trump repeat his performance in his first year? And voters are pretty much split on that. And so I, those, those are going to be the numbers that I'm going to be looking for on election night to try to explain what ends up happening. Steve, um, you on, uh, I guess we meet the press yeah, yesterday morning, had a nice screen there that looked at the splits when it comes to the issues that are out there. Uh, of course, uh, we at CNBC cover the economics uh, of all of this, and, and that's been a major issue. But there are several issues that uh, Harris leads on. Yeah, the biggest issue that Harris leads on, and, and this may tie into the gender gap that you and Mark were just talking about, is abortion. You know, when you ask which candidate would you prefer on issue X, abortion consistently for entire campaign. And this was true for Joe Biden uh, as well when he was still a candidate. That is where Harris has her biggest advantage over Trump. It's about 20 points in our, in our final poll here. Harris's advantage on abortion uh, over Trump. And again, that might be feeding that gender gap. I can put it up on the screen here that Mark is talking about. I mean, and this is what it looks like uh, among men, Trump with an 18 point advantage among women, uh, Harris with a 16 point advantage, 34 point total gender gap. That would be if this is what happens by 10 points, that would be the biggest gender gap ever recorded, something we've been talking about in presidential elections for about 40 years. And, and one other finding uh, in our poll that jumped out at me a little bit here was on the question of enthusiasm, asking voters on a scale of one to 10 yeah. to rate how enthusiastic they are. The nine tens, the highest, there was a bit of a disparity. Women, 80 percent of women put themselves in that category, 74 percent of men. So a little bit more enthusiasm among women. Micah, one thing that we've been talking about, we've been talking, uh, doing these polls for months now leading up to the election, and, and you uh, have been saying uh, over and over again that one of the big changes in this election is how party identification comes back even. It didn't used to be. There used to be a lead for Democrats. Talk about the history of this and what we're seeing in the polls that we've been doing. Yeah, so this is the first election where we've seen consistently break even party identification. That is for viewers at home, just as many Republicans as Democrats in our national samples. For comparison, 20, in 2012, most of our polls showed about a nine point party identification edge for Democrats. And that's been narrowing in the Trump era. This isn't pollster magic, Steve. This is an organic movement of voters that's part of a broader realignment that Mark and Steve just kind of hinted at. It's happening really in the Trump era over the last 12 years, and it's happening uh, along education lines, along class, and uh, along gender and ethnicity lines, where we're seeing pretty dramatic movements for black men and Hispanic men toward the Republican Party, Republican identification, and toward uh, Donald Trump in this election. 
And Jay, um, one thing that you've pointed out uh, pretty consistently is this flip. It used to be the problem of Democrats to get low income, working class voters out to the polls. These, this group now leans Republican, and that's really the issue for a Republican candidate now. That's right. It's uh, it's quite the flip on the old script, as uh, everyone else on the panel, I think, can attest to from previous presidential elections. You know, we have these low information, low interest voters who in the past uh, we in the Democratic Party have referred to as our turnouts. Those are the people that we need to get into the polls in order to get over the finish line and get our candidates elected this year. And this was, you know, has been clear really for most of the year. Uh, and I'm certain it was shown in our CNBC, last CNBC poll as well. Those low interest voters are going for Donald Trump by something like a 16 point margin, whereas the highest interest voters are kind of split between Harris and Trump. So, you know, the, the greater turnout in this election is going to work to the benefit of the Republican candidate. And that's something we haven't seen too much of in the past 20 years. And, and it's probably worth pointing out that there is no poll, I think, that's out there that can solve the issue of the Achilles heel of all polling, which is turnout. Micah, you and I had a good discussion. I was on my way home the other day, and I had this probably old antiquated notion that there were more 20 something Democratic kids who were out there knocking on doors than there were Republican kids. So I came up with this idea that, that when it came to the ground game, the Democrats probably had an advantage there. And you said, Steve, not so fast. Well, it really does uh, reignite the, con the conversation around gender because the difference between an 18 to 44 man, 18 to 44 women is stark when you look at the, uh, the party identification and vote intention. Um, another thing to understand is not everybody's moving in the same direction. There's been a swing and a hardening toward Democrats too uh, for party identification and specifically around college educated women. And so when you look at um, a place like Iowa, we saw a poll come out over the weekend where, uh, where uh, Harris was leading by three in a pretty traditionally red state. Um, that A lot of that movement was because there was underlying uh, movement among women and especially college educated women and independent women toward Harris, a very strong movement. And so all of this realignment happening underneath the numbers is really important. It's a little confusing to understand, but it's really important to understanding why we're at this uh, dead heat uh, as, a, as a country and we're just kind of uh, polarized and, and, and don't have really strong, uh, actually do have very strong basis of support for each of these candidates on both sides. Right. Mark, uh, talk about realignment and swings. We worked together in September on a poll on Latinos and I think both of our uh, eyes popped when we saw the results and there has been a big movement of Latinos, a critical group in this race. Talk about what you expect and what our polls showed there. Yeah, and just as Micah was mentioning the realignment where Democrats are doing so much better with women, particularly white women with college degrees, Republicans the last couple election cycles are doing better with Latino voters and at the margin some black voters and kind of a lot on the fault lines of whether they live in rural versus urban places on education level, male versus female. And, you know, Steve, I think one of the bigger uh, questions we're going to have to ask ourselves this election season is what force is bigger? Is it Repub that Republican improvement with Latino voters or is it Democrats winning uh, female voters and white women with college degrees by even greater margin? And one potential hit, a hint in our poll is that uh, white women uh, you end up having and also senior women are some of the most engaged, interested electoral uh, pieces in, in our poll. And so if, you, you know, if we're trying to make assumptions on who is going to turn out, you can bet women over the age of 50 are going to be turning out to vote, it's a little less clear whether Latino voters will. And, and that, to me, is one of the big mysteries right. heading into election night. Steve, one of my favorite parts of election night is watching you in front of the board call up these counties and showing your encyclopedic knowledge of these counties. But if you wouldn't mind just um, responding to Mark's point, M Mark's point here, is there a way to look at results as they come in and see how this Latino and black vote are, are, are breaking? What would you be looking at specifically to understand that issue? 
Yeah, I, I can show you one county you can key in on early in the night, too. Now, it's not in what we expect to be one of the battleground states. It's in Florida, but basically, Florida closes its polls mostly 7 o'clock Eastern, and they're one of the fastest counting states in the country. So within an hour, 90 minutes, you can have clarity in these counties. The one I'm going to look at when you talk about the Hispanic vote would be Osceola County. This is just south of Orlando. This is the, one of only three majority Hispanic counties uh, in Florida. A third of the population in Osceola County uh, is Puerto Rican ancestry. And, and just take a look here at what happened in 2020. Look, in this county in 2016, Hillary Clinton beat Trump by about 25 points. Now, Biden carried it in 2020, but the margin came down 11 points, just a 14-point uh, margin for Biden here. So in one of the most heavily Hispanic counties in Florida, this was actually one of the biggest gains Trump made in any county in Florida huh. in 2020. So I want to see here... When we get Osceola early, is that trend continuing? Wow, that's amazing. Now, Jay, we did a, a, a national poll in October, but also had a focus on a, a, an oversample, we call it, in the battleground states. And one of the amazing things about that, taking, talking about swing states and talking about reaching these, these voters, first of all, we found maybe more persuadable voters out there than we thought. But also this issue, Harris was doing a much better job in reaching, getting her message out in these swing states than it appeared Trump was doing. What did we find there, Jay? And this has been a story since uh, Harris entered this race. The massive advantage uh, she's had in fundraising has all gone into TV or largely gone into TV. And we asked if people in the battleground states had seen more ads for Trump, more ads for Harris or about equal numbers of ads for both. And to be clear, in the battleground states, People are seeing a lot of ads for both of these candidates. I live in Pennsylvania. I can uh, I, I can endorse the idea that there's lots of ads on the air right now. But when we ask them who they're seeing more of, by a three to one margin, people are seeing more ads from Kamala Harris. Among the persuadable voters that you mentioned, and that's people who are either undecided or who have not yet firmly committed to voting for their candidate, that advantage for Harris is 15 to one more likely to see ads from her than from Donald Trump. That's a pretty shocking and substantial advantage. And um, you were talking at the outset, Steve, about wow. what are we going to look at uh, when we know who the winner is? This may be one of those things, that big advantage that Harris has had uh, in the air wars. All right, I'll take that as your answer to what's going to be the final question here is I'm going to nail you guys down on this issue. Mark, let me start with you. It's Wednesday morning. We know who the winner is. It was fill in the blank. If it's Harris, what is the one or two things you look back on that says that was the thing? And same question for Trump. Yeah, and so, you know, Steve, to me, it's more kind of the late deciders and the overall news environment in the last two weeks. And even in our poll, when we ended up pushing people who were undecided and saying, all right, one more time, is it Harris or Donald Trump? Harris ended up doing a little bit better than Donald Trump did. And I think we can look at the totality of this news environment, kind of saying, okay, this is what got her across the finish line. But if it comes to explaining a Donald Trump victory, I just look back at our poll, 48% of voters retrospectively approve of Donald Trump's mm. job as president. That's higher than he ever had in our poll when he was president. It's higher than Joe Biden at 41%. And so that overall mood music over the last several months, in fact, over several years of people's perceptions of the Biden presidency versus Trump might end up explaining why Trump ends up winning. All right, Steve, same question to you, but you have the added burden of showing me a county or two that you would be looking at over the course of the evening that might tell us which way this thing is going. Uh, well, absolutely. Let's call one up here. Give me a second just to reset this. And we'll go up to Pennsylvania, 8 p.m. The polls ah. close in Pennsylvania. And where I want to look in Pennsylvania in particular, you take a look right here, excuse me, right here at Chester County. Let me just show you what's happened in Chester County. This is one of the big 
Collar County suburbs of Philadelphia. And you can see Biden won this thing by a little over 17 points in 2020. Uh, that was up from a nine point Clinton win. You go back to when Romney was running. This was a dead even county. This typifies what we see around the country in higher income suburbs with high concentrations of college diplomas. Dramatic movement away from the Donald Trump version of the Republican Party toward the Democrats. If Harris is holding on uh, to the win that Biden got in Pennsylvania, I'd say this number, look for this number to be over 60 percent for her. Does this continue? Wow. Does she get over 60 in Chester? If she's doing that there, she's probably doing similar growth in Montgomery County, similar big suburban county in, in uh, outside Philly and in suburbs all across the country that are like this. Awesome, Steve. And now, um, Micah, to you, what's the one or two things if, if Trump wins and one or two things if Harris wins? Yeah, I think we're going to be able to to look back and see the data that explains either one of these wins. If if Harris wins, it will be because of a strong anti-Trump motivation among her base voters and a do no harm message where she was able to um, uh, change some things about her previous stances and become le a, a, a less extreme candidate. And also, of course, as you've already mentioned, the massive money advantage that the campaign has. Um, it, it is a, a really hard thing to overcome and a reason that it's kind of surprising that this uh, this uh, election as 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 dead even and close toss up as it is. If Trump wins, it will be because of the three eyes, immigration, inflation, which we haven't talked much about, 66 percent of of. Uh, of voters say that their family is falling behind, their incomes are falling behind the the inflation rate and, that they're experiencing. And the final eye is indignation. I think people are on the Republican side, the base Republican voters are pretty uh, pretty angry, pretty fired up, and um, and there's a lot of uh, emotional uh, pent up from a pretty historic campaign, assassination attempts lots of charges uh, back and forth, and really nine years of uh, a Trump kind of a candidacy and presidency that, um, that has provided a lot of emotional fodder. Um, so all of this comes down to turnout, of course, and the challenges for the Trump campaign are, are higher because of the people that he needs to turn out, low propensity voters right. spread out over the entire country uh, as, con as compared to higher propensity voters that are very, very clustered in uh, in urban areas. Thank you, Micah. I'm going to answer the question very quickly, which is recollecting that our final poll of 2020, we had the Biden percentage correct. We were light on Trump support, but Trump support exactly equaled his approval on the economy. So not to be a cliche for the senior economics reporter here, but I think it's the inflation and immigration issues that would put Trump into the White House and the failure really of the Democrats to have a response on those two. And if it's uh, and, and one other aspect for Trump, which we haven't talked about, which is that women are very conflicted. We saw in our polling they were very badly affected by inflation. They kept saying it was a huge issue. And yet this issue of abortion and women's reproductive freedoms is something that would propel them to vote for Harris. That's on one side. And if it is Harris, it's her ability to put together the character issues together with those other issues, abortion and democracy, that would propel her to the White House. That's my take on it. Gentlemen, I am very, very obliged for your coming out. I thought this was great. Mark Murray, Steve Kornacki, Michael Roberts, and Jay Campbell.